Okay, so today's video is all about tensors. Tensors are a specialized data structure that are very similar to arrays and matrices. If you've used NumPy before, then tensors will feel familiar to you. It's important that you're comfortable working with tensors because in PyTorch, we use tensors to encode the inputs and outputs of a model, as well as the model's parameters. Now, we say that tensors are similar to NumPy's and the arrays. Uh, that's n-dimensional arrays, except that tensors can also run on GPUs and other hardware accelerators and this video is going to show you how to achieve that and how to use PyTorch Profiler to get timing information on running your operations with CUDA or just G uh, CPU. One other thing we'll see in this video is how tensors and NumPy arrays can often share the same underlying memory eliminating the need to copy data. We'll see a demo of all of that as we write our code in a second. And for the more advanced viewers, I also want to mention that tensors are optimized for automatic differentiation, something we'll talk about more when it comes to the autograd episodes of this PyTorch series. I'm already in my Python terminal, so I'm going to just hop right in. And the uh, first thing I want to do is to import Torch. Now, if you're following along this series, you want to start from the earlier videos where uh, I talk about installing PyTorch, getting it set up to run with your GPU, CUDA, installation, all of those things. Um, if you don't, haven't get any of that set up, you probably want to pause, put a pause on this video and watch the earlier ones before you come back to this. But assuming you have all of that, let's just go ahead and just say import torch. And it says no module name torch and that's because we did not um, activate our virtual environment machine. So let's do that. Get back in here and then now, now let's go ahead and say import torch. Now tensors can be initialized in various ways. We'll talk about four different ways to initialize a tensor. Now the first way is to just go ahead and just create a simple uh, list in Python. So I'm gonna go ahead create, go ahead, create uh, one, two, three, four, and that's just a simple Python list, right? Do you have a nested list in here? One, two, another list, three, four. So a list of two lists, and the first list is a one, two, the second list is three, four, right? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna say torch.tensor, that's the first method, and we're gonna pass in the list. So we're gonna say data. And this will just create our tensor. So you see a tensor and then you have the uh, tensor being initialized directly from the data, from this data source. Oftentimes we also want to uh, take advantage of NumPy to do some sort of uh, uh, arithmetic, to do some sort of wrangling uh, before we pass it onto uh, our deep learning uh, pipeline. So assuming you also have NumPy, let's go ahead and just import that. And you could also uh, create a tensor from a NumPy array and vice versa. You can also go from a, 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 a tensor to a NumPy array. You can go from a NumPy array to a tensor. So let's take a look at a, an example of that, right? So let's go ahead and create a NumPy data. So let's say NumPy data, and that would just be uh, np.array. I want to just pass in the earlier ones. So it's the equivalent of the earlier data. Just enter. So if we print that out, you see that it's just a NumPy array, right? It's nothing, it's not a tensor. And you could go from this to a PyTorch tensor. And the way you do that is to say torch. Now instead of torch.tensor, you say torch from NumPy. Then you pass in your NP data. Like that. But it's also worth noting that when you do it from NumPy, it also retains all of the properties of the, the original NumPy data. So all the properties, for example, the shape, right? So let's go ahead and just uh, do the same one again up here. Uh, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna assign, uh, assign this to x, variable x. So this is from NumPy, right? And it retains the properties, for example, shape, for example, data type. So I could say something like dtype. And it would just tell me this is integer and 64-bit. Uh, and I could also say something like shape. And you see this is a size of two. There's two arrays in there. And then each array will contain two. So this, uh, this is the dimension of it, right? And this is also the behavior if you were to take a tensor and you would create a tensor from another tensor. So um, in our case here, let's see, we have uh, x equals to torch from numpy and then we are trying to get um, so x let's take a look at x x is a tensor now right so x is created in here torch from numpy so it has a shape it has a, a, a data type and let's say we create a y and we say y and we say torch now let's create a matrix of ones and let's just say ones like and we put x in here if we take a look at y, now it's just a, a matrix of ones and you will see that it also retain the shape. So let's say y dot shape and let's say y dot d type and you notice that it's the same as x, okay? But of course, if you wanna overwrite that, you can. So you could also say something like torch, uh, let's click z now, torch dot ran like. So this is just random using the same dimension, so ran like, and I'm gonna say x here, 
And now let's say I want to overwrite the data type. I don't want the data type to be integer 64 anymore. So what I want to have is let's say, uh, let's give it a float, right? So we say torch.float and we're going to close that out. If we print Z, we have all the four different random numbers. So this is van like. But you can now confirm that if you check the D type, it would be the float that you um, assign here. All right, so I'm going to clear all my terminal out here. So the first method is from directly from data. Have you seen that? So the first method is directly from data. Second method is from a NumPy array. And the third method is from a tensor. So you're creating a tensor from another tensor. Uh, you could also create it with some random value, which is also quite common. Sometimes you need to initialize some weights and you just random, randomly assign everything to one or just create some random uh, initializations. So you could do that. Uh, for example, I want to create a tensor with a shape, with a pretty fine shape. So I want to set a shape up and let's say the shape would be something like 2, 3. Um, you could have 2, 3, 4. You could have 2, 3, 1. Uh, let's just say 2, 3. Uh, you could have a top tuple like that. And if I just go ahead and just use brand, it just give me some random numbers in here. Just random, uh, randomly initialize the tensor with uh, that shape. And so now you have a uh, dimension of 2 and then within the 2, each one of them have 3. Right? So 2, 3. Uh, you could also say instead of rand, you could say once, and that's just gonna initialize again to a one metric, once matrix. So uh, again, the same dimensions. Uh, of course, if you have once, you would also have zeros. This could be useful when you're building some sort of newer network and you want to assign that to be a zero, and then um, uh, as you do your back propagation, as you try to uh, uh, update the weights, you, uh, you modify the value. So these are very commonly used for initialization. For example, you initialize to everything to be one or everything to be zero, and that's kind of how you do it. Uh, if you want to see where your top, where, you, where where these tensors are actually stored on your machine, on your device, uh, you could also actually say something like torch. Um, let's actually see, do we have tensor right now? No, we don't. So let's go ahead and create one. Let's say torch. Uh, let's say tensor. Uh, actually, instead of zeros, let's say ran. So just a random number. And instead of 2, 3, let's go and have 3, 4, right? So let's just create a, 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 a tensor. And you've seen how I do shape. You've seen how I do uh, data type. But you also could do a device, and this will tell you where the device tensor is stored on, the device that the tensor is stored on. So right now it's stored on the CPU, all right? So uh, I want to show you how to profile that against uh, CUDA and, and because some of the deep learning, a lot of the deep learning uh, algorithms, uh, they perform so much better on GPU. And if you can afford a GPU on your machine, you absolutely want to take advantage of that. You don't want to be using CPU when you actually uh, have a compatible um, graphics card, for example, right? So how do we get this to move to our GPU so that when we do our arithmetic or matrix manipulation, um, it's a lot more efficient, a lot more powerful, all right? So uh, one way you could do that is you could check for whether or not you have CUDA. And if you follow all my earlier videos in this series, then you should be able to do this now because we've done that before. So you say torch.cuda dot is available. And on my machine it is, so it's a true. So you could go ahead and be a bit more defensive. You said, if this is available, then what do you want to do? You want to say, take that and then create a tensor. Take the tensor that you created, which is up, right up here, this tensor, this tensor right here. I want to say, take that and you say do, and you move it to CUDA. So that's how you do it. And if you use this two method, uh, after uh, make sure you check for this, right? Make sure that you check for the GPU availability because you don't know where your code is going to be deployed. What if your code is running on your machine or GPU, but then you deploy that onto the cloud and you don't have the uh, a, a CUDA compatible uh, device or graphics card on that machine, uh, you end up trying to run that on GPU, assuming that's going to work and it's not. So you don't want to, you, you actually want to check first and say that, okay, uh, check that the uh, GPU availability, uh, check that that is true and then run that. So now if I print tensor again, let's take a look. See, now it says device equals to CUDA zero. And that's your default uh, CUDA device. Uh, just like NumPy, let's clear off this again. Just like NumPy, you could do slicing. You could do something like NumPy. Uh, you, you can use a very NumPy-like syntax for indexing and for slicing. So what I mean by that is I could say something like tensor and I could say something like, let's say take the first index and you say zero and you would just bring out this one. Um, you could of course do zero and then zero to something. You could do that as well. Uh, I could also go ahead and say this is okay. This is the first row. But what if I want to take the last row? Right. I said start with the last row. We put a negative one. We get the last row. What if I want to take the first column? So I want to take 0 0.073, 0 0.6866, and 0 0.8619. So how would I do that? Uh, you could say something like take all of the rows and then take only the first column. So that would be it. And now you have 0 0.073, 0 0.6866. 0 0.8619. Uh, 
and if you were to set a value, so let's say you want to set all of this to be one. So I'm going to just say set this to be a one or set this to be a zero rather. So if I print out tensor, you see, this is how I set it as well. So it's very similar to how you would use NumPy. The indexing and the slicing syntax is very similar, very familiar to a lot of us, right? Um, you can also use torch, um, cat dot, torch dot cat to sort of concatenate uh, to uh, a sequence of tensors. So I would say something like cat and you could maybe concatenate. In this case here, I just want to keep it simple. I'm just going to concatenate them just like that. want to make sure though that we put in a square bracket around that. And you can concatenate them along a certain dimension. So I won't, uh, I could have it uh, concatenate on the first dimension or on the second dimension, basically like on the row or on the, on the column. So I could put something like dime equals to one, uh, but the default uh, would be dime equals to zero and that would still work. And so you see this being concatenated that way. But if you wanna uh, change the dimension of which it's concatenating, you can. Uh, but notice that I did not assign this back to tensor. So this is all just doing the operation just to demo, just to show you how to um, just to give you some quick warm up about tensor, we didn't we didn't actually modify tensor, and so it's still a, currently a, still a three times four uh, tensor. So clear the screen again. Now let's talk about arithmetic operations. Okay, so a very common thing in neural networks, a very common thing for deep learning is you have to learn about this thing called a matrix multiplication. Uh, basically, the idea is how do you take a matrix and then multiply another matrix, right? So when we talk about this, um, you have to understand that there are certain conditions under which a matrix can multiply uh, with another matrix. So if you're uh, feeling a bit rusty with your algebra, you could maybe go on Wikipedia and look up the matrix multiplication condition, see what can, under what condition can you multiply a matrix. Uh, I'm going to actually pull that up on Wikipedia to show you an, an illustration of that. So here you go. Uh, <laughs> this is the matrix multiplication condition, right? So this is a, a linear algebra matrix multiplication. It's an operation that produces a matrix from two matrices. So the resulting matrix is known as the matrix product, right? And it will have the number of rows of the first and the number of the columns of the second matrix. Now, this is a bit confusing, but I'm going to give you a quick, quick crash course here, right? So uh, looking at this dimension, what do you have? You have L times M, right? L being the first dimension, that's the number of rows. So in this case, it's five. And then M, it being the number of columns, so that's three. So this is a five times three, all right? So there's five rows, three columns. And then the B is the second matrix. The, the, this is a... Uh, m times n, right? So m being 3 and n being 4. So this is a 3 times 4 matrix. So you have a 5 times 3 times 3 times 4. Um, so this is okay. This is this meets the condition. You can actually multiply them because the in the inside um, a dimension, the internal dimension, this is a 3, this is a 3. So m, uh, m and m, they're the same. So you can multiply them. And the, the result of that, the output of that would be, an, uh, would take the shape, would take the dimension of an L times n, the outer dimensions, right? So this tells you that you can. Now, if I have a, if my A is an L times M, but my B is something like, let's say instead of three, I have, let's say four, four times three. Now that is not possible because this is a, this is a N being three. This also needs to have three rows in order to multiply. Otherwise it will not meet the uh, condition for you to do this multiplication, right? So this is a, quite a basic tool of linear algebra. If you want to read more about that, you could go and uh, maybe uh, watch some YouTube videos about that. So going back to this, if we look at tensor.shape, so this is a three times four. Now, how do we, if I want to show you how to do a tensor multiplication, I need another tensor that has the dimension of four times something else. So if it's a four, seven, then I will have the, the resulting output, right? The, the product would be a three times seven because the, in, the internal uh, matrix, they agree with each other. It's a four, it's a four and it's a four. Um, and what I can do is I can, multiply them and then the resulting product would be a three times seven, the outer dimensions, all right? I could quickly transpose this and then show you the shape and now it would be four times three. So the transpose, let me show you tensor. Now if I transpose that, this is how it looks like, right? So it takes the three times, it takes the three, three times four and uh, sort of shape it into a four times three. So now I can take these two and multiply them. And if I were to multiply them, the result would be three times three because the inside, they will agree with each other, four, four, and the, the resulting output would be three times three. And so how, how do we do all of that? So to do this, this is called a matrix multiplication. And you would be able to do something like tensor.matmul and that would be multiplication. And so tensor.matmul is gonna take the first tensor, multiply by the second uh, tensor. And the second tensor would need to be the transpose of this so that they could produce the three times three, all right? So I would say something like tensor.t just to transpose that, look at the result. And now I have the result. And notice that all of this is performed on my CUDA uh, device, right? So on my GPU and not on my CPU. So I have the result. Actually, there's also a short form 
Um, but let me show you the second way of doing a matri matrix multiplication. You could also use torch.matmul and you just have to pass in the both uh, tensor and pass in tensor.t, right? So that is also equivalent. This is saying that take the first one, multiply by the second one, right? And here you have the same result. So this is the second method. So first one is to just take the first one, the first tensor, and then multiply, put the name of the second tensor. Or you could say torch.matmul and then put the name of the first tensor and the name of the second tensor. Uh, another way to do that using a shorthand is to say tensor and you use this at sign and to say at tensor.t. All right, that's also a third way to do it and the result will be equivalent. So you see the results are all the same. You could say tensor.matmu, pass in the name of the second tensor. You could say torch.matmu, pass in the name of the first tensor, the name of the second tensor. You could say tensor at tech, tensor.t. And you need to sort of um, uh, uh, know that they're equivalent even though you could just stick to one of them because when you read up papers and you read up uh, you know other kind of like coding uh, projects other people's projects you will see different syntax um, you commonly you see matmu and you also see this so you want to at least know what they're doing so that uh, when you read up uh, technical papers or when you're doing uh, or, or looking at uh, open source projects research projects uh, you at least understand that this is the same uh, as matmu uh, you don't want to confuse the idea of a uh, matrix multiplication with an element wise uh, multiplication so this is not the same as if you would take this and you say multiply by tensor uh, so what happens when you do tensor multiply by tensor is that you're doing it element wise so let me show you what i mean by that right um if i show you tensor so this is tensor and what you're doing here is that you're taking this multiply by its own value uh element from element so zero times zero zero uh, 0 0.6596 so this is 0 0.7 times 0 0.7 that's about 0 0.43 so when you're doing this element-wise, you're using this uh, as a sign, they're different from the matrix multiplication. So you want to be clear when you say matmu, that's a matrix multiplication. That's kind of the whole um, uh, things that I was explaining earlier. Uh, they're not the same as an element-wise product, right? If you don't want to use the sign, uh, you could also say the tensor.mu. So multiply, and you just have to pass in a second mod tensor. Uh, in here, I, I multiply it by itself, and uh, same result as the one up here, right? Same results. Say tensor again, say tensor plus tensor, it's also going to do a element-wise addition. So uh, this is going to take 0 0.73 uh, plus 0 0.73, which means multiply by uh, 2, right? 0 0.68 multiplied by 2, which is uh, basically 0 0.68 plus itself, 0 0.86 plus itself, and then same thing in here. This is also uh, element-wise. And so same thing here, if you do a minus, it's the same thing, right? Uh, one thing you can do as well with a tensor is that if I have a one element tensor, so for example, how do I have one element tensor? If I take a sum, okay, this is gonna basically give me a one element tensor, so taking all the values and aggregating them in down into one value, 3.4279, I can convert that into a Python numerical using item, right? So I could take this, um, let's go and say tensor.sum, I could take this value. If I want this to be a Python, uh, just a basic Python numeric, I could actually say something like dot item, and that would just collect that into a Python uh, numeric value. So that would just give me the value, uh, and I can continue to use this value um, just like any other Python uh, numeric. Okay. Passing type, just to confirm that, and you will see that it's just a normal Python float. Uh, speaking about arithmetic, there's one thing you wanna actually pay attention to, is that sometimes you come across code that does something like uh, so, for example, you see an in-place operation. Now, I'm going to show you an example of that. Instead of doing add and then say something like 3, this is going to add 3 to all of the values, but it doesn't modify the tensor, the underlying tensor, right? It's just saying add, but I did not assign that back to tensor. So, if I want to have that uh, persisted to tensor, I would have to do something at like tensor.add, correct? But sometimes you see code that says something like add and then underscore. Um, just to make the, dif the value a bit different, I'm going to make it 7, just to show you what it looks like. When you see an underscore after that uh, um, operand, this is an in-place operation, which means I do not need to assign that, it will modify the tensor in place. So let me run that, and now you see this is a tensor. But if I print tensor again, you see tensor is now modified in place. All right. So every time you see that uh, uh, an operand is denoted with a underscore suffix, this, for example, tensor.copy, Right or let's say trans transpose, modify tensor in place. This will change the value of tensor, right? So you wanna at least watch out for that. This is 
this could be problematic when computing derivative because of the loss of history because you can't really sort of undo the operation easily uh, i mean sort of in transpose you can you just have to transpose it again but uh, but generally speaking the the use is discouraged but you do need to know what it means when you see code like that especially when you're reading research papers and you see some implementation that you make use of that uh, you need to know what it what it's doing right i'm gonna go ahead and undo the change Now earlier I said that uh, tensors on the CPU and NumPy arrays can share their underlying memory locations and changing one will change the other and that will save you some memory space because you don't have to uh, copy data from, from a PyTorch tensor to NumPy and then you know, perform some arithmetic and then convert that back to NumPy. You don't have to do that. You don't have to copy this data uh, manually and uh, it would save you a lot of underlying memory as well. So how do, we, how do we do that? So let's clear the space. We have tensor. If I go ahead and create a NumPy, so I'm going to say n, n is basically my NumPy, all right? I'm going to say t.numpy. Uh, that's not t, that's tensor. If I look at n, this is actually a NumPy array. And you know that because it says array, it doesn't say tensor. So n is my NumPy array, and NumPy array is created from calling NumPy.numpy on my tensor. So when I call NumPy on my tensor, I end up with a NumPy array. And if you compare that to my tensor, you see that uh, they're, they're the same values, just one is just copied to the other, all right? Now what will surprise you is if I were to go ahead and just use add, I told you not to do it in place, but just to illustrate the point, um, let me just add a one in here, right? I'm modifying the tensor. I'm modifying the tensor. If I run that, whoops, tensor, right? Tensor has been modified. So tensor should have the new value. But did I touch n, which is the NumPy array? I did not. Right? I, there, there is no point in here that I touch my NumPy array. There is no change in value in NumPy array. But remember what I told you about them sharing the same underlying memory locations? So now, if I were to print n, it may surprise you, but the value of n has also changed. In that, uh, basically, they are actually the same thing, uh, pointing at the same memory location. So when you change uh, any, if you change the tensor, you're also changing the NumPy array. Uh, and this is also same the other way right so why does i create a numpy array right i'm gonna just go and initialize that to uh, let's say three four and show you what it looks like it's just uh, a three times four matrix or in this case it's an np array numpy array right now i could go ahead and now create a tensor and this is using the same thing that you've seen before up there um in the earlier in the earlier part of this video i show you how you could say uh, one of the ways I said there are four ways to initialize, uh, four common ways to initialize a, uh, a tensor, and so one of the ways is from a NumPy. So I, I can do this, and I can say t just to show you this is a tensor, and I got this from my NumPy. All right. Now let's say I go ahead and just say NumPy dot add, and I want to add some values to it. I want to add maybe top point four to it or point five, right? Doesn't matter. And I'm going to say the output of that pass it back to NumPy the the same NumPy array. So if I were to do that and I were to run and you will see that n has been modified because I said the output of that, the output of this value should be passed on to n. So I have modified the NumPy array, but what happened to my tensor? So let's take a look at my tensor now. If I run t, you see that tensor has also been updated, right? So this is uh, what I spoke about in terms of NumPy and tensors on the CPU can share uh, the same underlying memory location. So changing one will change the other, all right? And to sort of end this video, I want to show you a few more, well, well, just one more trick really. Just want to show you how to use the profiler. This touches on a, a concept called the auto grab. We haven't talked about that yet. It will be coming um, in this series, but not in this video. But auto grab includes a profiler that lets you inspect the cost of different operators inside your model, both on the CPU and on the GPU. And this PyTorch uh, auto grab profiler is quite, kind of, it's a, it's a pretty good way to just get timing information uh, very quickly without writing a lot of uh, overhead code of like starting the time, ending the time, and then checking the time, and then uh, doing that 1,000 times, and then finding an average. You don't have to do all of this stuff. Uh, a lot of you who have seen me done this kind of profiling, you see me do it like uh, writing with a start time and then end time, you minus the, take the end minus the, uh, the, the start, and then you end up doing it 1,000 times, right? You don't want to do that now. This is, uh, there is a built-in uh, profiler that you can use. So let's go ahead and just create a, um, let's make sure that we're doing, using CUDA. So I can say CUDA equals to torch dot, device and I'm gonna say use my CUDA device you see me do that before so uh, nothing fancy and I want to just create a tensor again uh, because now I'm gonna say torch and again I'm gonna have the three uh, three four again because that we're used to it now seeing it so I'm gonna say device is now pointing at the CUDA 
All right. So if I have multiple, I can have the first device, second device, second and multiple. Right now, I'm just using one device here. So I'm going to say device equals to CUDA and take a look at Tensor. It has, okay, this is created. It's created on my CUDA GD, GPU. All right. Now to use the profiler, I could use a context manager and say something like with uh, torch dot autograd dot profiler dot profile. Typically, this is good enough, but I would want to pass in a use CUDA. I want to say use CUDA, set that to true. And I want to say set, give it a name. This context manager name is called prof, uh, basically short for profiler, profile. And I'm going to go ahead and say for I in range, do it 100 times. And this is up to you. This is any number. You can start to write your function. You can call your function and this could be something like model.fit. Uh, you could say something like model uh, and then whatever. You could do something like this and then that's it. That's it. That's the end of it. It would then uh, uh, run the profiler against this function, this Python function. But since I don't have that, I'm just going to create something simple. I'm going to say for uh, underscore range 100, for example. And I want to run this 100 times, right? So you start from zero all the way up to 99. And I'm going to type it again. And I want to say y equals to tensor. Let's do what we done earlier. So what do we? What if we do a matrix multiplication? So I want to say tensor. Uh, matrix mole, so mat mole, tensor dot uh, transpose. So I have a three, I have a three times four, and a multiply a matrix multiplication of a four times three. So the output will be a three times three. All right. So I'm gonna say that is good enough. Run that, and it says that okay, it has the first stage is to warm up, then the stage is collection, and they have uh, completed both processes. So if I go ahead now and I would just say print. Now, what, what do I name it? I name it prof. So short for profiler. So I don't have to type the whole thing out there. And I can say print prof. Um, okay, this is, I need to get more space. So let me adjust my view of it. Really making it full screen now, just to show you because it's going to print a lot of things, right? Uh, I'm going to clear my screen again. Print prof again, all right? So let me go all the way up there. Uh, even then it's still, this is the CUDA uh, time average it takes. Oh, when you see MS, oh, you don't actually see any MS. So when you see MS, it's milliseconds. But when you see this sort of like the US, that's a microsecond. That's one millionth of one second. So one million of one million of that would give you one second. So it's one millionth of one second. So it's way smaller than uh, 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 milliseconds, right? Uh, a millisecond is one thousand of one second. Uh, a microsecond is one millionth of one second. So one microsecond, uh, one thousand microsecond will give you one millisecond. All right. So this is uh, these are very small times because the the operation is actually quite simple. Um, the operation is really nothing fancy. Just taking the tensor and mat mode. Um, so you can see. Okay. So let's take a look at this. This is a CPU time average. It takes thirty two. Uh, this is a CUDA time average. It takes thirty five. And you can compare them and you see that, okay, if it doesn't give you any kind of benefit because the operation is so simple, uh, then you probably don't want to use CUDA. But if you see that, there's, and, and usually in most real life scenarios, of course, the CUDA would give you much better performance. But this is a really, really trivial example of taking a matrix, a small matrix multiplying um, over its transpose um, uh, self. So uh, that really isn't a lot of surprise here when you look at the time difference comparisons there. But that's kind of it. That's kind of how you can profile your code using the autograd profiler. And that could come in quite handy as we start to build some more complex projects. Um, but this, this video is really about tensors, really getting used to thinking about working with tensors and how do you get from a, a NumPy array to tensors and, and, and vice versa and how to think about the, the in terms of memory allocation and all of those things. So that's, that's kind of it for uh, uh, this part of the video. And in the next part of the video, we're going to do something more exciting. Uh, going to data sets and data loaders and actually use data sets and data loaders to actually load in uh, actual data to perform some sort of deep learning with uh, PyTorch. I'll see you in the next video.